Hello and welcome to Comic-Con at Home. I'm Maggie Lehrman, Editorial Director at Abrams Children's Books, and I'm thrilled to moderate today's panel all about Thomas Lennon's hilarious middle grade book series, Ronan Boyle. The Ronan Boyle books have hit the New York Times bestseller list and been called extremely funny by the Wall Street Journal. The third book arrives on November 16th, 2021. Uh, today, we will be chatting with Tom about all things Ronan Boyle, and we will also have uh, John Hendricks, who illustrated these books, and the director of the forthcoming DreamWorks animation film based on the books, Fergal Riley. So I'm gonna start by introducing Thomas Lennon, uh, a writer, comedian, and actor who has worked on a number of things you probably love, including Reno 911 and Night at the Museum. He is the author of the New York Times bestselling Ronan Boyle book series. Tom lives in Los Angeles with his wife, the actress Jenny Robertson, and their son, Oliver. Hi, Tom. Hi, Maggie. This is so exciting. Uh, the, one of the great things about Comic-Con being at home yes. uh, right now is, you know, because if we were doing this in San Diego at the gas lamp, first of all, we'd, we'd each lose a fortune on, in, in Artist Alley at Comic-Con. Uh -huh. They usually, here's what happens. You go down Comic, uh, Comic Artist Alley and everybody wants to say hello and then you have to buy all of their art. That sounds you fun. Know? Yeah. Some of it's amazing. Some of it is sort of like slightly erotic unicorn stuff that I'm never quite that into, but I buy it anyway. You know, and then you're in the gas lamp and then you go to some weird San Diego restaurant. So basically we're saving a small fortune by doing this. All right. Because That's we'd good. be in a pedicab. I know you, the last time we went to a book festival, we're on, we're on Zap scooter bikes, yes. zapping around. Yeah, that was really fun. I own a scooter now. We're getting off topic. Okay. Um, uh, I want to talk about Ronan Boyle, mm -hmm. um, which is the book series that you wrote. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear what your three sentence pitch for the entire series is. This, uh, the whole series, the very simple idea was what if there was a police force that looked after the fairy folk of Ireland um, and dealt with, I, I felt like, you know, if you look at the mythology, Irish mythology, it's never really been handled in, in too many ways. I mean, there's a couple, there's uh, the Artemis Fowl uh, books, which are terrific, by the way. Uh, there's, um, you know, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, which actually I love. Um, not everybody does, but, you know, a very sort of Brigadoon version of leprechauns. But I, I never grew up thinking of leprechauns as like the Lucky Charms box. I always uh, grew up with the notion that leprechauns are very mischievous and are basically really up to no good most of the time. Uh, which to me, you know, so then I, I, I thought, the more I thought about it, what I wanted to do was take something so mythical and fantastical and apply uh, very boring bureaucratic aspects to it. Like that's one of my favorite things is, is like in the, in the, all of the books, like the fines and the fees and the, yeah. like the prison sentences. And they're all, nothing's like, <laughs> the only thing that's crazy are the creatures. Everything mm -hmm. else is like, you know, uh, being in a, a leprechaun caught in West Meat is like a 15 euro fine. Like things are- Yeah, I now. think <laughs> I think Ronan ends the book in severe debt. Um, he ends his book, I don't even want to go into where he is at, at in book three, but because he has to buy most of his own supplies, I'm not really sure where that came from, but I really do enjoy that he ends up being charged. By the way, that carries over into the films. You uh, you get charged for every single thing. If you get a new shillelagh, which I see that you're showing off your shillelagh back there, um, you, uh, you get charged for that. That, by the way, I think this is a great moment to uh, address this. That, so what, what Maggie's holding right here, that is a, a real shillelagh or shillelagh made in the town of shillelagh or shillelagh, really, in Ireland. Yours, did yours say Maggie Gobra? It does, it says Maggie Gobra. Maggie Gobra, which just means, uh, if you ever see Aaron Gobra, that always means, for, for Gobra means forever. So that just means Maggie Gobra. Um, and it's heavy. It's... It is the entire reason that the book series started mm -hmm. uh, was I was looking at one of those and thinking, what if that was really, you know, what if you had a job where you had to carry that? And the, really the only thing it's perfect for would be whacking a leprechaun right on the top of the head as hard as you can. 
but it doesn't really matter because you can't both you can't kill leprechauns and they live for thousands of years so um but and, anyway, they, was, and their that, names yeah. I've, i i feel like they have uh that's one of the wonderful things about the book is uh the leprechauns uh exalted names i think when you bought the book maggie you bought it because of that reason for the most part ah. <laughs> because i came into abrams and you had given, so leprechauns have names like uh, Eileen, whose emerald eyes sparkle like a, th whose eyes sparkle like a thousand emeralds in the sun. Um, uh, or Log McDougall's parents, who uh, I believe Log's mom is named, her, her, legs go on, uh, her legs go on for days. And they're never really true. And uh, like we Glenn with the world's most gorgeous ears. But leprechauns just love to have, they hate, they hate human names because they're so boring. I don't know if it's because my name is Tom that <laughs> that all the leprechauns have amazing names in the book. But uh, when I first went into the Abrams offices, Maggie, uh, you had done everybody's name tags as if they were a leprechaun name, and I was like, "This is the home for these books." This was uh, I loved yeah. doing it, and actually, I, I was just ducking away because I was looking for. I still have my have, little. Do you still have them? My little placard. It's somewhere. I can't find it was right now. Maggie but yeah, it's. Who, uh, Maggie, whose Maggie. pen runs red with blood. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Um, yeah, so then, so, you know, I, I had sort of a notion of the book and I, I, I'm trying to remember what I gave you to read that first time, um, but it was basically about, not that much happened in the very first version of the book. It was like Ronan could fit down into a scary little part of the castle where there's a changeling, which is when the leprechaun swipes uh, a human baby for like a little ugly monster or a leprechaun or sometimes a log. Uh, it's called a chain changeling. So Ronan has to go down a castle. And then really there's like a sort of a, a, a heist was in the first draft of the book. And then he sort of did, he did a fair amount of training. And there were certain things you had to learn to become, to work for the special unit guard like weaponized poetry, shillelagh, shillelagh combat uh, and yeah. training obviously. Well, I can tell you what I remember when I first got it was that it was, first of all, hilarious. Um, I mean, all of the details were so funny. Um, and then it was just this fully realized world of leprechauns and bureaucracy um, and a kid who, although actually the first, when I first got it, he wasn't as much of a kid as he is in the books. It is such an interesting detail because everybody has an age that they sort of want him to be. So in the book version, he was sort of like a 19 year old kid in the, mm -hmm. the original draft. And then we, we aged him down a little bit, which I think was a good idea for the books. And now in the movies, you'll find he's a tiny bit older again too, which some of it makes sense. I think I've told you this, a lot of it, a lot of Ronan stuff, which comes up in all of the books is sort of about his mentorship with Siobhan de Valera. Mm -hmm. And, you know, written certainly from like, based on my own experience of being like this awkward teenager with allergies. Everything about Ronan, it's a great writing trick, by the way. When in doubt, say, say something embarrassing and weird about yourself as if it's the character, and then you're just done. But all the weird, horrible feelings that he has and the social anxiety, the allergies, it's so easy. If it's just you, then just put it in the thing. And everybody's like, how'd you come up with this weird guy? It's so weird. His face is all puffy and he's allergic to everything and he's he, he feels nervous in every room he walks into. He thinks he's, well, that was a fascinating detail of your editing. And but I'd like to address for a minute. The, the books are always funny when I give them, but they're mostly sure. just funny. <laughs> they're mostly just funny. <clears throat> and then you turn them into a book by asking me great questions. Um, like, you know, what did you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you asked a bigger question. question. And then they, yeah, and then they, then they actually turn into books. Uh, but like for a great one, a great example of that would be the second book, uh, Swamp of Certain Death, where I, there was a lot of fun action happening. And I, I knew what, you know, I'd, I mean, I loved, we can spoil it. I mean, people can, can get the book at uh, Abrams. Um, but Ronan ends up where in the place where St. Patrick had banished all the snakes. To. I was going to mention the snakes. That's, I think, my favorite scene in book two. Um, oh, great. And it's so funny. I forgot that the way that the way that Ronan, I was really proud of the way that Ronan gets out of that situation. He's like, well, what did St. Patrick do? Get rid of the snakes. And he preached the good news of Jesus at them. And it turns out that the snakes just 
it's just a big eye roll for them. It doesn't, it, they can't relate. So it just, it just bums them out and they, they move along. But what I didn't have for, for book two was like the theme, like what was the theme of the book? And that's when you brought up the idea of uh, imposter syndrome, which was something I was totally not aware of uh, as a thing. And then realized, oh, I, I have it completely. And then again, once again, we've given the character one of my strange disorders <laughs> to uh, to flesh out the book. And it really made that book to me make like so much sense. The feeling of, and I think that comes up that comes up a bit in into the strange place. Um, the feeling of like, should I be? Am I allowed to be? Here? You know, right? Like, why? Well, I think in I, uh, yeah, by the time you get to the third book, too. He's feeling more confident, which is really satisfying um, after being with him for so long. To, I know. I, when I got to the end of the third book, which I, uh, you, the problem is you granted me many delays, and I just think about things. I just kept thinking and mulling, thinking and mulling. And then the last time you were like, no, you can't delay it anymore, <laughs> which was amazing, because that's, by the way, that's what writers, if you're a writer, you can't. If someone gives you uh, a stay of execution, it's the worst, because then you'll just keep puttering and pondering, like pointing a quill on your lip, fluffing around. But then I got to the, the actual end of book three. And I don't know what happened. I had like, uh, my family will attest to it. Everyone, the neighborhood was concerned because I came out of like the room that I write in back of our house. And I just started I was, like uncontrollably soft, kind of like shaking and stuff. It was just like this weird, you know, you know, it was a very, like it was a very upbeat nervous breakdown. I had a sort of an upbeat nervous breakdown on the, on yeah. the, the last book, and I think it was because I yeah. It was it's also a, you. I think you delivered it in March of 2021, which means you you'd had a year, you know. Yeah. We all had. It was, a, it was a crazy year, that too. Yeah, but then it was also like trying to sort of like figure out like what is Ronan's last like what's the if this is the last time we see Ronan. I don't know what it is, but um, in the books, like what's, you know, the thing. And I think it becomes really a book about liking yourself at the very end, <laughs> you know, like that, it's really, I think the last book is really, that's almost the only real thing it's about, sort of this, you know, yeah. the, the endless questioning. And, and and it's fun because you, who I believe I described you as the world's greatest book editor and at least a couple of the acknowledgements, but, I mean, there really is no books without you. It's really not. I mean, because like, I mean, that's the, I lost my train of thought, but because um, you just find, the, you know, exactly the, because, oh, oh, I know what it was, but just because of Ronan's self-doubt and his tangents and all the books, you've actually had to, I think, cut some of his internal monologues by like half because I think there's a one one point like he talks about he's not sure if he's in love with Catherine de Valera or not and I think there was like almost like a two and a half three page thing that he goes through in his head <laughs> at one point you very wisely were like I think this that's a lot that's a lot of mm -hmm. just like him yeah but you you always know you were also so right about something in book three that I don't want to spoil it but the weaponized there was a great little thing maybe we'll do it if we do a different book there was a weaponized personality based on one of my cousins, and I'm not gonna say who it is, there was a special courier when you have to move a, a, like a really dangerous fairy folk. Oh around. yeah, uh-huh. And he's just, and the, the personality is that he's just adorable. <laughs> he's like in a track suit, he wants to go golfing. You you remember, yeah, anyway. You, sure. you, you forced me to make the good decisions every time. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, it's like a total pleasure to work on these. Um, I think, you know, every time I read them, I'm laughing out loud. Um, and that's always, you know, I'm reading these books a dozen times. So that's saying something. Yay. I'm really, I'm really proud of this last one. I'm so excited. Are we going, is John Henry's coming in now? I think so. Is John, is, is John time, around? Right? John is our illustrator. Right Let me give him an intro. Yay. Hi, John. I, I can tell people who you are. Um, 
John Hendricks is the illustrator of McToad Moe's Tiny Island and the Ronan Boyle series, as well as the author illustrator of Shooting at the Stars and The Faithful Spy, which won the 2018 Society of Illustrators Gold Medal and received four starred reviews. He lives in Webster Groves, Missouri. Hi, John. John, Hello. thank you for coming. And um, first question, how did you come to the Ronan Boyle series and what was appealing to you about working on it? Well, my good friend Chad Beckerman, art director, uh, sent me this project and said, this has been designed in a lab for you to enjoy. <laughs> uh, and it's true. Um, I read the first book, devoured it, laughed. I mean, any kid's book with uh, gratuitous Pogues and Sinead O'Connor references, I'm immediately going to be uh, interested in. But yeah, I mean, Tom's writing is so visual. I, I mean, I've illustrated a lot of works and his, his stuff is made for illustrations. It's, it's honestly too easy because there is just so much visual information to sort of dive in and uh, start drawing with. So really, this, I mean, the hard part for me is what am I not going to draw? So I mean, I, I read through the books and then I make a list of everything I want to draw. And it, it's like dozens and dozens of things. And then I got to call it down and find the ones that are going to really represent the best moments for the book. Yeah. And how do you, how are you making these? What's your materials and process? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a Luddite. I don't hate technology, but I cannot get over the feeling of pen on paper. So all these drawings are original pen drawings on paper that I watercolor. And then I, I do some, you know, digital surgery on them later, but you know, it's, it's to me, my work is best when it's, basically this this uh, simple relationship of pen paper idea right and so that's what I'm always trying to get back to when I'm drawing oh yeah and we're looking at them now and I'm just like these are from the first book and they're so beautiful and it's just it's funny I haven't looked at these in a while so it's, <laughs> it's really really thrilling to see them yeah I, I remember I was excited the day I that uh, I got the call from Maggie that it was going to be you and I was like John Hendricks I'm like that can't be the same guy like the drawing is magic guy I was like, oh my God, because I, I have a, a rack of John Hendrick books in my house already. That is so great. That's the first time he actually goes to the actual bridge of riddles. Hence the well, I mean, I, I, did, I shouldn't say this, but I would have done this for free, uh, but I'm oh, glad great. I got paid. But I mean, th this is when you are a kid and you're like, maybe someday I'm going to grow up and draw pictures for a living. Like this is the project that you think about getting. Um, to me, this is like what illustrators were born to do, like an amazing story that you get to do. It's like it's like old fashioned and pure, like you do the cover, you do chapter spots, you do these full page things like fleshing out a visual story for young people that is an imaginative world like this. It's like this is this is why you're made to draw stuff to, to me. So it's been a it's been a pleasure the whole time. I was sad, you know, Tom, I was like you, when I got to the end of the last illustration, which I had just finished before I left on a vacation last week, I, I was sad. I was like, that- Do we get, do we get to see some of those? <laughs> yeah, I think- some of the, Cause yeah. the, I, I, I've seen all of the Into the Strange Place drawings and they're, oh my God, that's Wolf, Wolf Do. So that's where the wolf hounds live. One of my favorite, I mean, I love all your stuff here. But yeah, that was really it's fun. It's like, awesome. a, it's like a, a wolf hound hotel, but it's yep. like built into the side of a, yeah, it's great the only nice okay. part of the special unit headquarters <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 Super i got to cozy. draw some of i got to draw some of the you know special unit headquarters in the new new book too which was fun i, I love that setting uh the collins house the the you know i just it's so evocative of of what you i've never been to ireland but it's truly like that's one of the fun things about drawing is you get to visit places in your imagination and so just d dwelling in that place was great so John, what, how do you feel like, because you also write and illustrate your own books. So what's the kind of mental difference between illustrating someone else's work and illustrating your own? Yeah, I, you know, I bet it's probably similar to Tom when he's, you know, acting in something that has been written for him versus, you know, when he's writing it himself. It's like, it's, it's fun when you do it yourself because you can control the content and, and the voice and everything. Um, but there's also something really exciting about, being, being forced into a particular narrative or a story that you did not make, you know? And, and that has a challenge that I think oh, illustrators have to like embrace, yeah. The, the Ucky Evil, that was the, the, <laughs> yes, the, right. the, the steamboat called the Ucky Evil in book two, which was at one point must've been called the Lucky Devil, but look at that drawing. Oh, at Quasos, I don't know if we've talked about Quasos. this. A lot, of people, mm -hmm. a lot of people ask me, 
if a class host was based on my relationship working with Matt Perry, which was interesting. <laughs> and the answer was no, it, it wasn't. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was actually, and I, I'll say this, I can openly say this, I haven't talked about it very much, but in my in my mind, when I do a Quasos, it's pretty much Morrissey. Uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's a, this is a great run. This is when, again, Maggie Lerman teaches me a lot about writing books. But if you remember in book two, Ronan becomes the much put upon sidekick of a unicorn who's got a very popular show. Yeah, he's uh, like a Vegas act. He's a yeah. Vegas act. There's a big buffet called the Buffet of Miracles. Right. Well, and, and he's a little chunky. That was what was fun about drawing him. Like, how do you draw like a slightly chunky unicorn? You know, I think he does. I believe he does 16 shows a day, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's of course, drinking the, the entire time. <laughs> right. I think is the other important part. <laughs> and the shows get slightly better. I think it's <laughs> like his yes. first 12 shows are not great. Right. And then like there's a weird dip and then they get better and better and better. But there's a weird thing. So in that in that show Ronan gets set on fire he falls through trap doors basically unicorns just hate leprechauns so he's got a gig pretending to be a leprechaun but it's the first time he feels really really useful like mm. that he's great at something is <laughs> like being set on fire a couple times a day and like getting kicked into holes <laughs> yeah, it was such a funny like unexpected reaction to the whole scenario it just really instead of just having Ronan be tortured constantly, which is kind of what happens in the books. Um, mm -hmm. In this one case, the torture is something that gives him a real sense of purpose. First time yeah, Ronan's really, got that, really great. He's got that it quality, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's amazing to me, John and Maggie just like, oh my God, and there's that's under the stage. He's about to be rescued by a uh, log. And uh, that's actually, is that Rhee or Lily in this part of the book? Uh, Lily, yeah. Or that's Lily. It? That's Rhee, actually. There's two giant oh, things right. in the book. Yeah, One's yeah, Lily yeah. and one's Rhee. Um, but they're there. Look at the detail of this. They're, now we're under the stage. There's a Quasos doing his show up above. <laughs> There's the trap door down below, and then the sewers that run out of the resort town. So good. And Log's got uh, all the, of course, uh, these are great details here in John's drawing. All of oh, the. And, and uh, so much of like the fun of illustration is like, as a, as a practice, illustration should uh, not just be merely like a caption for the text, right? So you have to have the illustration doing something fundamentally different than the text mm -hmm. in order to get this kind of third thing that's created between both text and image. It is neither text and image, and that's the story living in your mind. And, uh, and so a lot of that just comes from you know, point of view and how, how can I show this image in a way that, that unfolds something different than what was explained in the text. So a lot of my, my early work is just in the book is just visualizing, like, I definitely know I want Gary, uh, you know, going up the wall, but this how is, uh, yeah. you see it. Yeah. Such an amazing rendition of Gary, the Scottish werewolf, his superpower, the most uh, stunning thing about him is not that he's a werewolf. It's his, it's his ferocious Scottish. <laughs> yes. One. It's my favorite thing. It's like at one point Ronan realizes he's got a ferocious werewolf who's now a pretty good friend, but the werewolf aspect is just like a small part of his personality. It's not really what makes him so unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And that's the wind, that's the wall that complains when you climb up it. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, the, the winch wall. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one thing that's so fun about your your writing time to draw to is just the like the visual uh, gags like that. It's like set pieces. Like, I feel like you're writing for someone to make sets of these things. And so it's like it's truly a, a like wind wall. Like, let me let me draw that, please. Yeah. Tom, did you are you surprised by these illustrations when they come in? Uh, every time, every time I'm. Uh... I always think, oh, and now we're into this, by the way, now we're into, this is Ronan Boyle, Into the Strange Place. Oh yeah, these are the this new ones, one never before early seen. Drawings. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. This is Laura the Cave Whale, um, who is uh, described as the most inap uh, inaccurately named creature in mythology, because she's a cave whale, but her name is Laura. Um, and she, there's this, uh, it's on the map. That's a, a great thing. And uh, uh, having a map, having John's map for getting into the, all of the rest of the book was an invaluable thing because this oh, is yeah. that, in, I mean, on the map that's called the very short cut and it's on the in the in the first map in the very first book that, that John drew yeah the the entrance into this scene is there it's called the very short cut you have to kind of zoom very close in um, yeah yeah totally, it's really I mean, great 
Tolkien started the. I mean, he finished the map before he did all the stories, right? I mean, you, you, have, to. you have to have the map, and then you fill out the stories inside of the map. Kind of have to, yeah. Because yeah. I think and then, too, course, for a for of... a book like, oh, sorry, for a book no, like this ahead, where then. anything can happen, um, I feel like you need a map in order to kind of define your locations just a little bit, just the tiniest bit, so that well, then you can and have I a did, wild. Adventure. I did this map uh, for book one and didn't know any of these places. And then so to get to book three and be like, oh, we're finally going to, you know, this the strange we, place where I mean it's it's awesome. <laughs> the weird thing is we used almost every place on the map, but not yeah. quite. Like we actually never go to the town of doors where uh -huh. all the doors are. Right. <clears throat> which is sort of based on Door County, Wisconsin. And I don't think we never go to the the dangerous unicorn mating area, which I think is fine. I think that's probably self-explanatory. Seems seems, yeah. seems too scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, what's next? Are we ready for Fergal? Or is he not is here? Fergal coming in? This will be so fun. I see him down there. His, his... All right. So I think it is time for us to uh, bring in Fergal Riley, who is uh, the director of the Ronan Boyle and the Bridge of Riddles film. So Fergal Riley is an Irish film director, storyboard artist, voice actor, and animator, best known for directing the animated film, The Angry Birds Movie. He is the director of the forthcoming movie, as I mentioned, from DreamWorks Animation, based on Tom's book series. Hello, Fergal. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Hi, Tom. Um, Hi, Fergal. We oh, are Fergal, great, and John, thank you Maggie, for. Maggie, John. Hey, hey, Maggie. Yeah, we all know each John, other. lovely to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I am so curious. I'm on the book side. I uh, I don't get to interact with the film side very much, so I'm very curious um, how this all came about and how you came on board for the movie. And Tom, um, if you want to ch chime in there too and tell us the story. Um, I'd well. Like I'd actually love to hear because I've been writing drafts of the movie for a while, um, which is tough because I didn't have Maggie Lerman to sort me out. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, I'd written a draft of Ronan Boyle and the Bridge of Riddles that had like 12 songs in it, all of which were completely pointless and insane. <laughs> I think Fergal probably got to see that draft. Um, and then uh, Fergal from why don't you take it from your point of view when you got the script and you said, this is a mess, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd sort of gone in to see DreamWorks um, about, about a, a, a different project uh, and, and uh, their, their executives there, Chris Couser, uh, he, he's, uh, he was like, he held up this book uh, with John's wonderful illustration, and he said, "This is a this is a book you might be interested in because uh, you were born in Ireland, and uh, I know that you love Irish mythology." And I was like, "Well, I'm very interested in this book." So, so I I, I read the book first, and um, and was completely sort of enchanted by the world that Tom uh, had created. Um, it was. Uh, a very unexpected um, uh, world for me. And that's kind of what hooked me straight away. It was set in contemporary Ireland. There was a, a, a deep knowledge of the culture and of uh, most importantly, one of the strongest things that came through was the, the voice, the sense of humor, the, uh, the sort of that je ne sais quoi of, a, of sort of Irish humor that, that um, uh, Tom, is clearly uh, born into and fluent into, and uh, it clearly uh, gets more, uh, it gets stronger with each generation. So, so um, he had a he had a, a a really deep insight into that in the story, and he created these wonderful characters, which I was totally intrigued by right off the start, and and uh, and just really wanted to. Uh, open the door into this world and and um, and I saw the excitement on DreamWorks uh, sort of among the ranks in DreamWorks for the project because it was a brand new world it was very unexpected and it was uh, very very funny yeah that's wonderful so I don't know how much you guys can share but where are you 
in the process of this movie approximately? And what can you tell us about the movie so far? Probably anything that's, you know, that's not major spoilers, but so I'd probably been writing scripts before Fergal came on for several months, at least probably six months or maybe more. Um, and then it's always very exciting news. And, and I'll be honest, uh, as a person whose life has been mostly in the movie business, you, you hardly ever get a director on your movie. <laughs> like often you just write a script and you write a script and it was basically like, uh, if you know what a Tibetan uh, mandala is, it's just a painting in sand and you make it and the second you're done, you wipe it away. And that's almost every movie script. So when I got the call, um, I got a call from Drew and they said, there's a new director. And this could either be the greatest day of your life or the scariest day of your life. And I was like, Who, who's the director? And they're like, you're going to like him. I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, it's Fergal Riley. I'm like, oh my God, I do like him. That's crazy. Uh, but Fergal, how, how far would you say, I mean, other than scripts upon scripts upon scripts, we rewrite the movie every day almost, yeah? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we've been on this, uh, well, I've been on the movie with Tom you know, practically every day for a year. So we are well stuck in um, uh, and it's become sort of like uh, this amazing creative marriage. Um, Tom, I consider has become a, a really great friend apart from, you know, apart from like the work that we're doing. And I'd say that we're, you know, we're, 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 we're sort of in the, the uh, we're sort of, we're, we're assembling all the ingredients for the movie. It's sort of like an alchemy to sort of take a, a project um, and translate it from like one form into another, from a book in this case into a, a big DreamWorks movie. And uh, it's, um, it's been super fun every single day. And there's an energy that we've generated because I think uh, every day you're sort of advocating for your for your baby, you know, and you're, and you know, uh, I mean, we've, we're, we're well into the script process, as Tom can tell you, we're, we're um, many, many drafts in actually, and uh, we, we have, um, we have a small crew of uh, handpicked uh, visual alchemists and storytellers and visual development artists that are sort of helping me create the world of the movie, and um, it's, it's very exciting at this point because um, because we're sort of at the point where uh, people see the they see the amazing potential of the characters in the world and and um, and what's amazing is and this never happens this never happens but I have the original creator of the uh, of this entire universe. Um, like uh, I have him like basically uh, usually uh, with me every single day. I mean, Tom what is Fergal's trying to say. Is, usually, the the writer gets fired immediately. <laughs> 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 Nor in any normal movie at this point in the process, I would have been fired three times. But uh -huh. uh, luckily, Fergal's got me uh, every day, which is exciting. Well, one thing that's fun that I think is going to surprise people. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Fergal is how much of the book, especially book one, is in the movie. Like totally. it, yeah, like I guess it that's, often doesn't happen, yeah. That's a yeah. big question from my end too, is mm -hmm. like, what are the yeah. changes and how did, I know that it has to, it has to adapt, it has to be its own thing and live on its own, but I'm, I'm wondering how you approached kind of what to keep and what to, what to cut and all of that. Well, uh, I mean, that's the great thing about having the creator I mean, Tom writing the screen, the, the 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 screenplay, and I mean, the thing is, he's been a bit modest because, as everyone knows, Tom is one of the world's best uh, 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 comedy screenwriters, and um, that is just a gift. And it never happens um, that you get a creator of one work who also knows how to. There's a handful of people in the world who can do that, and maybe not even do it as well because. I mean, uh, because of the experience that Tom has as a very practiced screenwriter, but um, uh, it's it's I'm trying to imagine what this would be like doing it 
on my own without um, Tom's input as the creator. And it would be a very different process, especially at a, a big, uh, in a big development department at a studio like DreamWorks or Disney or Pixar, you know, uh, um, because the, the process um, to birth a movie um, takes a while and, um, and it, ha it goes through sort of, um, you know, it goes through many, many changes as you sort of adapt it from one form into the other. And um, I mean, one of the, the, the biggest things is the book, the book is a densely packed tale and the movie is 90 minutes, you know, so we have to make selections. Um, that said, though, I, I, yeah. I think well, one thing that's fun is what you'll see without, without any spoilers, because there's some fun, cool new things. But in currently in The Bridge of Riddle, and it seems like it's shaping up pictures, there's Ronan, there's Siobhan de Valera, there's Lily, there's Dooley, the relationship with parents, there's Colin's house, there's The Bridge of Riddle, there's Pickle Bar, without giving spoilers. These aren't spoilers, they're in the book. It's all in the there, book. You could have bought the book. Bottom, there's there's the, still yeah, there's, by yeah. the book. But uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of great stuff has remained, which is also amazing because I think so frequently I'll, you'll go see a film, um, and you'll be like, "What? Wait, wait what? <laughs> what happened to the thing? It was a thing that we were doing, and now it's like this is just a movie that could literally be anything." And the answer is because that's because the system sometimes gets gets wonky. But I think because there's well, a level I think of yeah. It's also because you're a cinematic storyteller, even when you, yeah. when you read the books. And so that translation, uh, Tom understands on an innate level, the, um, the concepts um, that he writes in his books um, are much easier. Uh, it's a much easier translation uh, because they're inherently cinematic in the first place. So, so, yeah. um, so the way he thinks about character and the way he thinks about conflict and the way he thinks about uh, the fun or the funniness of a situation is um, it's almost like when you when you put it through our process, uh, you distill it down um, and it becomes, you know, um, it becomes cinematically funny and it becomes uh, cinematic in, in, you know, in every sort of facet of, of, of the world. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's tons from from the original book, and we're, we've mostly focused uh, on the original book and on the main relationship between Siobhan and Ronan. That's great. That's the I cool. love to hear it. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to me because you know, Tom, you and I, the book just lives between us for a long time, yeah. and then yeah. John comes in, and then it's me, you, and John. Um, and that's it, basically. And then we publish it. Um, you know, we have people checking the grammar and the commas and a design, a beautiful designer and other people. But it, uh, it as a as a content, it's really the three of us for a while. Uh, and I feel like in a movie, you're just dealing with such a different scale of of humanity involved. You know, you've got um, you need so many more resources um, to make a movie. Um, yeah, we do, but I think it's it's. It's nice that we've got two people on the movie that are have a, a fanatical sort of, uh, I, I think we both feel like a sort of a cultural significance to like, you know, you get, we get one chance at the big Irish mythology movie, you know, people have taken a couple of swings at it, but I just can't, can't mess it up. <laughs> we can't, and there's so much pointless Irish trivia in it. It is just a nonstop, <laughs> pointless Irish trivia machine. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, it is. I mean, what what was what was really um, striking when I read the the book first, and then um, the subsequent drafts was that it is um, a deep, beautiful love letter to Ireland, and um, and that is a very strong draw for me because. Um, I mean, Tom was inspired by the stories that his grandmother told him and uh, Irish grandmothers, I'm telling you, they know how to tell a good story. My, gra my own grandmother was the same way and, and um, I'd written some of her stories down and there was, a, there was, a, there was an instant when I, when I read 
um, Bridge of Riddles, there was this sort of like thing that was just seeping in its bones and the bones of the book that was just this love for Ireland and this, um, this extraordinary um, attempt to sort of reach through to the reader and communicate um, a, a, an idea of Ireland that everybody has in their mind, um, but also um, there's, the, there's that line that you find when you just step off the plane and go into the country, as Tom will tell you, um, where it's, there is a sense of, um, there's a sense that the place uh, just is layered with mystery and um, uh, different uh, past that, you know, is kind of, you know, just very deep and mysterious. Yeah. Magic. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's really funny. I can't explain it. Yeah, I was going to, it's yeah. like, it does have this respect for the, for the land and love for Ireland, but it's very irreverent too, you know, it it's to not be. taking it, it anything too really seriously. Be, exactly, yeah. It couldn't really be an Irish book if it didn't. Yeah, and we love, have a we, sense love of about it, we are sort of a, 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 an, a an irreverent uh, uh, a little race and, um, and the culture, uh, uh, likes to make fun of itself and the, and and sort of um th there's something about um the humor of ireland that um it it pokes it it always turns first on itself and looks at itself and magnifies all the flaws and all the sort of uh the the sort of the their normality and the and the banality of like just trying to be a person in this world and trying to sort of trying to just sort of get on with it you know and and um and and tom uh, tom's humor is is um very much drawn from 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 that sort of thing that that the, the sort of the the flaws of existence you know trying to just get through the world and and uh and um and and when you deal with when you when you encounter a problem uh, sometimes it's just so ridiculous that you just have to say, you just have to laugh at it and you just kind of have to, to, uh, laugh at yourself in order to, in order to survive the obstacle, you know, and, uh, and, and, and that's what's, it, it, that's what reaches through to the reader, I think as well, is that sort of, um, connection with, with just, uh, we're all in this together and you know what it, you know, it, today it just happens to be. Uh, a bloody leprechaun who's just uh, ripped me off, and um, and these leprechauns, as you know, aren't aren't uh, aren't your grandmother's leprechauns. They're not the leprechauns of Darby O'Gill. These have a these have a whole other. Uh, uh, well, and that's why I am so excited to see what your team does to visualize this world. Uh, I mean, my kids were asking me, they're like, "Dad, are you worried about?" them like ruining your, your <laughs> yes and I and I said that that's not how illustration works there's no definitive vision of a story and that's why like I grew up reading Tolkien with the brothers Hildebrand uh and so that's my vision of the world and so but to see to, to uh, see Jackson's version of it 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 didn't diminish it 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 adds and that's what's great about stories like they can be visualized in so many ways and it just it enfolds new uh, wonder into the story. So I, I can't wait to see what you guys do with it. That's yeah, awesome. same here. Yeah. Thank cool. you all so much. Yeah. Any other final thoughts before I wrap us up or? Um, uh, yes, Into the Strange Place. Runable Into the Strange Place. It's right behind John Hendricks. My favorite story about John Hendricks, real quickly, is he just put his name on the cover of the first book. And I was like, that was such an awesome move. And it looked amazing. This is a lesson, kids. Put yep. your name on the cover every time. You make them tell you to take it off, you know? Yeah. They're never going to, especially right. when it looks that awesome. <laughs> oh, there's all the gorgeous covers. Look at that. Wow. And three is one of the great covers just ever. I mean, and also, you know, we, uh, we planned from the very beginning that if you lined up the spines, it would be the colors of the Irish flag. Uh -huh. That's one hundred percent John Hendricks's idea. Thank you. I wish I could. I wish I could be any part of the the cleverness that <laughs> made that happen. But that was uh, that's you guys. But that's a secret for the so box cool. set when they when they get all three together. Greg, when you line them up. Um. But wow, look at that cover of three. So neat. There he is under in the. Uh, you know, I I just love being part of this. I love being a player in this uh, 
in sort of Tom's creation. You know, each of us has has a role to play, and um, it's this continuous thing. So, you know, um, Tom created the this body of a story. You know, over these three books, and uh, and now it's going into a movie, and and it feels like the adventure continues. You know, so um, I'm uh... really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Me as, too. We, uh, as we wrap up, I think I can, minor spoiler, I can tell you Fergal has to go because he's going to go record some Chauvin de Valera dialogue. All Ooh. right. Wow. It's a very cool thing to say that you're going to go do and it happens to be <laughs> You know, That's Mara, exciting. Mayor of Easttown had a Siobhan in it this year. I was like, hey, I, I know that name. Catching fire. <laughs> Catching fire. Weird, na- hard to pronounce names that are weird. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Well, thank you so much, um, all of you. Um, Tom, John, Fergal, thank you all for joining us in the conversation. And to the viewers out there, thank you for attending Comic-Con at Home and the Ronan Boyle panel. Just a reminder, the first two books in the Ronan Boyle series, Ronan Boyle and the Bridge of Riddles and Ronan Boyle and the Swamp of Certain Death are available now wherever books are sold. And the final book in the series, Ronan Boyle Into the Strange Place, will be published on November 16th and it is available for pre-order now. I'll just alone, wave my face. shillelagh and say goodbye. Awesome. And I'm gonna do the home alone face as we fade out. <laughs>